and also this iPad is a great prop because without it, I just look really awkward. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here like this. I like it as a prop. Yeah. I hate I to could, tell you anything, I... Russ. You look pretty awkward yeah. with it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. He was telling me earlier that I wasn't groomed enough to be on camera. <laughs> That's so mean. Did you say let's switch? <laughs> just run your hand through it. Trampy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think I think it's fair to say that um, when you've been in the industry for a long, long time, what, 25, 30 years, something like that. Uh, since nineteen eighty-eight. So that is quite a long time. time. So, how, how did you get that first job? I mean, I've heard you say before that this is the only only job you've ever really had. Right. I've so never so had how, a real job. So how, so, how do you go from you know school or college or something into uh, actually, I started, um, I, I was first published uh, when I was still in college. Right. And uh, it was really a matter of being in the right place at the right time. It got lucky. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine who had been playing, at the time I was playing uh, Iron Crown's Warmaster. Sure. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine went to a big convention in the U.S., uh, uh, Origins. And met some of the guys from Iron Crown right, yeah. and, you know, did the whole, oh, my GM is so great, you have to work for me, and blah, 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 <laughs> that thing. And uh, they gave him some writer's guidelines and happened to mention that uh, they were looking for a, a creature's book. Right, yeah. And so he came back and said, here, you have to do this. And he was, he was the kind of guy who was like, you have to do this right, and, and yeah. sort of forced it on me. Um, you know, in a good way, right? So, so it wasn't really a, a winning thing. It was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. You know, well, I mean, it was. It was probably one of those things that I'd been dreaming about for a long time, but I don't know if I'd actually set myself on the road specifically. Yeah, there wasn't a plan. There wasn't yeah, a, yeah. You know. well, you would have done otherwise then. What, if, you know, in, a, in another universe <laughs> where, where, where <laughs> yeah, Monty yeah, Good did not become a game designer, what, what, what is Monty Good? Um. You know, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> you know, uh, um, I had kind of set out to become a teacher. Right, yeah. Um, but uh, as I kind of got farther into that, I realized that wasn't for me. Mm. And uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's almost easier to answer the question if I could go back and read and do it all again, but I couldn't choose game design. Right, yeah. Um, I, uh, I probably would go into science. Sure. Things like that, but you know, I don't know. If I wouldn't end up in game design. I'd be a bomb. So. Okay. <laughs> so if you could go back, you would choose game design again, presumably. I would. You're, you're very, very happy with very with how things have turned out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, there was a while. It wasn't that long ago, I think, where you you stopped doing game design for a while, didn't you? I did. Did you actually? Did you say say you were doing it permanently, or? No, I I um I just I needed to take a break. I think I think the phrase that I used was I put it on the back burner. For a sure. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, I think that was right after uh, Tolus came out. Yeah. And I was a little a little burned out. I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you wrote that entire thing by hand, didn't you? <laughs> Every single copy. Every single copy, yeah. handwritten yeah. by yeah. me. Yeah. So yeah. I can imagine you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, I, I I tried a few other things. Uh, worked on some uh, video games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, things like that. You did a, a, a web series as well, didn't you? Um, yeah. Geek Seekers. Geek Seekers. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? Did you enjoy that process? Uh, I loved it very much. Um, you know, it's uh, kind of a, a another passion of mine mm. um, is is that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a way that I don't really get to express myself. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but so I had a lot of fun. Sure. Is, there, is there more of that in your future, do you think? I don't know. Um, you know, uh, we did that with uh, Jen Page. Yeah. And, uh, He's co-hosting the English this year, actually. That's right. He's that's right. He's bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Should be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, we both, unfortunately, are just so involved in so many different things mm. that uh, we sort of finished up the first series and, uh, you know, maybe we'll go back, maybe, maybe we won't. I don't know. That's true. So I don't want to ne neglect you, Shannon. <laughs> <They're just listening. laughs> um, I mean, you. I mean, you. Um, you've had a, a history in fiction for going back a, a similar amount of time, haven't you? 
Yeah, I actually have the almost the opposite of Monty's story in that yeah. I have three different degrees and uh, worked a myriad jobs yeah. in an attempt to avoid doing the thing that I wanted to do, which was be a writer. Right. Because I kept thinking if I if I try this writer thing and I fail, I, I don't know what else I would ever do. This is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So I spent a lot of time avoiding being a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and finally gave that up because I wasn't <laughs> working very well. Um, and then I went into I started as a newspaper journalist, which was uh, great because I learned how to write very fast. Yeah, on a deadline, yeah, yeah. Uh, not be super uh, crazy about the words, because I'd come from poetry before that, which you know, is all about very slow Right, slow yeah, and, and when, you, when you're writing RPG books, I imagine that can be a disadvantage yeah. rather than a... Yeah, for sure. It, it, you know, I meet deadlines. Um, so then I moved into literary fiction, and then I moved into erotica, and then I moved into sort of sci-fi horror, and uh, then moved into uh, the game writing. And of course, I've, I've never left any of those things. I've sort of continued mm. to bring them with so how, how did you transition into the game writing side? You know, I I actually heard uh, so I was in my mid I was in my mid thirties. Uh, so this was almost ten years ago, and I was listening me? to a radio program. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was listening to a radio program, and I was working as a successful freelance writer, and I had my own business, and I was playing a lot of MMOs at the time. Mm. Um, I didn't have a local gaming group, so I wasn't playing RPGs. Um, and these these two women were talking on the radio, and there, there was a study that had come out that it said the growing number of gamers was was females who were successful in their mid thirties. And I thought, that is me. That's so awesome. And the two women on the program were like, that's impossible. What woman would play a game? Why would they? How would they have time? They're trying to have a career. And I was so mad at the that I actually um, I decided right then and there that I was going to start working in the industry. Um, and I started out uh, working for the World of Warcraft magazine and writing right, articles yeah, yeah. for them. And so that was sort of my uh, my impetus into into becoming um, le you know not just a gamer but someone who actually moved the industry forward. Right, sure. Well, I mean, you touched there on um, I know you've um, been on a panel on women in gaming earlier today, and there's a similar panel tomorrow, I believe. Um, what's that you said? Women in their thirties are a growing demographic. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. Yeah, stuff. it was. I mean, like I said, this was probably ten years ago, and so right, they were just yeah. saying it was the growing. They had done some kind of study and. Um, and I missed the first part of the interview, and so only heard the right. <laughs> only heard the backlash against it. Um, but it, it, you know, and it was focused on um, MMO specifically, and it seemed really interesting to me that I, I thought I was the only woman in my thirties with a career who was spending her free time, sure, yeah. you know, online. Yeah. I didn't know that there was a whole community out there, so I, I would imagine that there are still a lot of women who um, think that they are the only ones out there doing that. Sure. And when when you're talking about tabletop RPGs, do you feel that that, that demographic is growing? Also. Yeah, it's an interesting de demographic because it grows so differently um, than computer games, where you you know you have to go to the store and buy it, or you have to ha know someone. Like you can just know one person to find a, a video game uh, sort of partner, but to find someone to play a, a, an RPG with is it's more of a group. It's more cultural, and so there's because of the way that that spreads out. I think there's more opportunity yeah. for it to spread into all different kinds of areas. Um, it does seem like we're seeing more women, especially young women, um, which is great. And it does seem like we're seeing more women come in who, you know, who actually want to be part of the industry mm. and who want to work in the field. And yeah. That's really exciting. And there's some great too. examples of women in the game industry. Um, Lisa Stevens is a fantastic role model. I think um, Andromeda Juice, people like that, yeah. have some wonderful role models there. But if we could uh, sort of jump back in time again to um, the you at Iron Crown. So, um, what, what was it like working in the industry at that time? I mean, compared com compared to today, where it seems to me that the industry is, you know, it's more, it's more polished today. It's more experienced. It knows, you know, back, back then, was it more experimental? Was it? In, in a way, it was. Um, it, so I came in probably right at sort of the end of that kind of, you know, hey, we've got a game group. Let's make, a, make ourselves a game company yeah. and publish a game mm -hmm. sort of era uh, that existed then. And... You know, it's it's funny to look back because all the major players um, in the in the industry, right up all the way to the top, TSR, mm. um, they're all different now, um, and so it's it's been interesting to watch that evolve and to see not just uh, how or not just that it happened, but how it happened and, and kind of you know what people did right and what people did wrong mm. and um, you know there was I think that probably the big difference was back then. Everyone was a gamer, which is great, but not necessarily everyone was a publisher or a business person, oh, well, which is not that's as great. Necessarily true these days, either. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, it, that is true. Um, but 
Um, it's it's just it's so different now because uh, the barriers for entry have sort of shifted yeah. in that if you're uh, you know an avid gamer who just really wants to get their their thing out there, um, there's there's so many venues you don't have to actually get funding and sure. capital and get a bunch yeah, of and employees. And there's been a couple of big big shifts like I think you were one of the um, would be spearheaded PDF publishing. Yeah, ten, ten, ten years ago. Two thousand and one. Yeah, yeah it's nearly fifteen years ago. Yeah, and that and was that, early that on. Changed with, everything. Yeah, right? and then and then of course Kickstarter comes along ten years later changed and does the same thing again. Exactly. And you know, each time the barriers to entry are, are, are lowering each time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, which I think is a good thing because it it infuses the industry with you know new ideas and creativity and and uh, you know the idea that that there might people out there who have some wonderful ideas but can't get mm. in because you know someone told them no yeah but now there's yeah. there's so many ways to get around that mm. you know with Kickstarter yeah and, and okay, you've uh, benefited, benefited from that yourself as well twice, right. very, very successfully yeah we're very uh, very grateful to to the advent of Kickstarter are you, are you familiar with the Millie Cook concept the what the Millie Cook Millie Cook because the Millie Wheaton Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so if a cook is half a million dollars, <laughs> I see where this is going. All right. <laughs> I, I think I, I even made we a chart at one point. <laughs> I think I think Kevin Culp, Culp is a, a tenth of a mini cook or something like that. I can't, I can't remember what it was, but <laughs> but, but yeah, you were at TSR for you know for a long time. So you you saw TSR evolve and. And devolve and, and devolve and, and, <laughs> and transition over to to, to Wizards. Right. I mean, what, what, what was what was that like? That experience when all you know moved from TSR to Wizards. I mean, was there you know, fear of your job security? It, were, were people worried? Or? Well, so in in ninety six and ninety seven, things at TSR got really bad. Yeah. And um, for a while there, TSR just stopped publishing altogether. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, they yeah. owned the printer too much yeah. money to get them to keep going. Uh, and that was a scary time. Everyone, you know, worried about their job and, and everything. And so, ironically, the big fear at TSR was that they were going to, uh, the TSR would be bought out by Hasbro. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, lucky that never happened. <laughs> uh, because at the time, Hasbro had a, had a reputation of, of kind of coming in, buying up all the uh, intellectual property and, and firing off the staff. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we were afraid of that. Uh, so Wizards of the Coast, in so many ways, was kind of a godsend uh, that, you know, Peter came in, Peter Atkinson came in, was a huge D&D fan, mm. you know, wanted to, to come in and help the company and, and save the brand and, and everything. And so that was all really great. Um, the transition was, I think, rougher than, than he thought it was going to be, um, just in terms of, you know, uh, you can almost imagine any kind of situation where you've got a group of people you know, who are doing creative, interesting things, and then another group of people who are doing creative, interesting things. You can't just smash them together sure. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and expect yeah. it to all go smoothly. Yeah. But, but Peter, um, what, what's he like to work under? Uh, Peter's great. Um, Peter's a, a really good guy, and uh, I, I, I find him really pleasant to be around. Mm. And uh, you no, know, I've, when, I've only met him a couple of times, but he's always been very, you know, very, very pleasant. Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, I worked with him directly uh, when we were working on third edition mm -hmm. because, at least at the start of third edition, uh, he took a real hands-on approach um, and you know attended a lot of the meetings mm -hmm. and, and whatnot that we had. And was was there a lot of Peter's vision in in third edition? Then? Um, you know, there was a lot of initial directives. Um, Peter was a big fan of first edition and not a big fan of second. Right. Okay. And so uh, that was kind of the initial course that, that we were given. Um, you know, I, I can remember, you know, little sort of specific things like, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea that NPCs and PCs use exactly all the same rules, mm -hmm. uh, right down to monsters, I think it was something that Peter really wanted. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the ability to... Uh, Create to to facilitate high level play was also really important right. to Peter. Yeah. So things like that, um, you know, kind of if you want to say it that way, came down from on high. Yeah, um, sure, yeah. sure. Because you ended up being one of the the core team working on that day. Yeah, 
How, how did that come about? Um, so it was uh, right after we came to Wizards of the Coast. So this was 19, late 1997. Mm -hmm. And basically they, they put out a call uh, uh, to everyone working in the department saying, if you'd like to work on the design team, write up a document about what you would do. Right. If you could create a new edition. Of okay, so you had an aud audition for this. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, did you get anything out of that? I think just or about it, everybody. Or was it just three people? No, <laughs> I think. I mean, you know, uh, working on the new edition, I think, is sort of the the gem uh, uh, assignment. So I think just about everybody uh, put put their uh, put their uh, ideas forth. Um, and initially, uh, it was. Skip Williams and uh, Rich Baker and I. Right, yeah. yeah. And so you spent, what, two, three years working on that edition? Almost three years. I mean, yeah. that must have been quite a time. So you must have known something big was happening at the time. Well, it was. It was. Um, it was. It, what a lot of people don't realize um, is that things were actually fairly dire for D&D. For &D. And so there was a lot of pressure on us that if third edition was a failure, D and D probably was not it really. Would be, it would be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Not I mean, uh, D &D. <laughs> you mean second edition sales were were terrible by the late nineties, yeah. and and things were things were not good. It was, it was, uh, you know, succeed or was die. It, was that a sense of you know we're 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 trying to save D D and D? Was that the it was you know the overall sort of feeling there? There was, um, but you know, yeah. I mean that 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 feeling ever since the Wizards of the Coast buyout was kind of pervasive, right? Yeah. This idea that, and it's actually something that means a lot to me personally, which is this idea that D&D &D means more than just something, that a, a company's brand, or even more than just a game, mm -hmm. right? That it is, it is this experience, this cultural phenomena, this, you know, this thing that meant so right, much to yeah. me yeah. and yeah. millions yeah. of other people. Yeah. So. I mean, it's interesting. I was reading something that Ryan Dancy said just the other day say that they were reading it the other day. Um, and uh, he mentioned that one of his goals of the OGL was to make sure that D&D could never be, you know, never be removed from the market by the capricious, uh, I can't talk, capricious <laughs> decisions of its publisher. Right. And, uh, and uh, that he feels he succeeded in that, that particular goal. Yeah. I mean, was, was, that, uh, was that just him or was that a, a thing that other people felt as well? Um, I think that, I think that that was something that everybody, you know, it took it took Ryan a while to kind of sell the company mm. on the OGL, um, and I think it took it took him a while to sell the the creative team as well. But I think it took him less time with us than it did with with more. Was, was he like alone spearheading that then? Or? Uh, to begin with, I mean, you know, it is really it is really to you know to his credit, it, he is sort of the the architect of that whole oh, okay. concept. Um, because initially, you know, we thought, well, you know, we didn't understand. Well, what, why are we going to allow other people? Yeah, to yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But you know, basically, it was what you just said that that sold me this idea that this ensures that that D and D will always be around, mm. no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, then when Taser come along and pick up one branch of D and D, while Wizard of the Coast continue on another, right. so then you end up with multiple D and Ds, right? Right. Quite, although they might not have that name, but you know they are, you know they're, they're multiple D and Ds. And right, right, right. Well, I mean that, that's certainly the sort of weird situation that I don't know that anyone ever predicted was that, you know, the number one role playing game in the world would be D and D, and the second would be D and D. Yes. And, <laughs> and the contention is merely which D and D is yeah, actually yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. which is which. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting times. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the OGL is something you used yourself as well. So a little later when you started Mal Havoc. And you left Wizard of the Coast in the early 2000s. 2001. 2001. Yeah. Um, that was, what was that, shortly after Peter Atkinson left? It was. was that, what was the reason for you leaving? Um, well, there were a lot of reasons. Uh, and, you know, none of them were sort of ill will or anything like that. Mm. In fact, I kept working as a freelancer. And, yeah, you, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, did a, did a few things, uh, Ghost Walk, Book of Wild Darkness. Um, so there was, there was none of that, but, um, you know, part of it was me. I think I work better when there aren't 
people in suits kind of standing above right. me telling me what, you know, yeah. I shouldn't, shouldn't, yeah, right? environmental thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I could also see sort of, there was a, the winds of change were blowing. Mm. Um, and that, uh, you know, Peter, with Peter leaving and it was clearly becoming more of a business. Right, yeah. You know, or, 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 or it was always a business, but I mean, always more of just a business. Did you leave before? No, that was after it went to Hasbro, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, so yeah. It was that was 2000, maybe? Yeah, so that presumably would have had quite a bit of a corporate yeah. effect on the corporate environment. That was its... It did, yeah. Yeah. So you move over to, you know, start running your own company, which I assume is a very, you know, a very different set of skills to, to writing. You know, D and D for Wizards of the Coast. You know, right? You know, you know, not just writing D and D for yourself, essentially, but you're you're running a business, you're running a company. I mean, did you did you have the skills at the start necessarily to do that? Did you learn those as as it went along, or? Um, you know, not that I knew of. Um, <laughs> although, uh, you know, I I think Ryan, who you, who you mentioned, uh, once once said somewhere he wrote somewhere that that I was the best brand manager that he had ever seen mm. in that the brand that I was managing was was Monty Cook yes um, yeah we'll get on to that <laughs> <laughs> and you know but that's all if, if that's true I mean um, it's it's really just happenstance I mean I, I never I never set out to be a small business owner mm. or, or anything like that uh, so much of what I've done has just come out of necessity. You know, you mentioned PDFs. Yes. And, uh, you know, I started with uh, a PDF, uh, the Book of Eldritch Might. Yes. And, you know, I did that not because I was thinking to myself, oh, this is the wave of the future. Yeah, I'm so I smart. Had a movement. Yeah. yeah, and it was the only way I knew how to get the product out Right, there. yeah. <laughs> so you can't take the credit at all. No, <laughs> no it's just, uh, you know... Uh, I, I do. Sort of it, was, it was an exciting time. I mean, that oh, that yeah. book was, you know, and I mean, you weren't the only person doing it. You certainly, I don't know if you were the first, but you're certainly one of the first, weren't you? Uh, you were so, right at the start. But. So much so, I still remember very clearly staying up almost all night, just scouring the internet, looking for somebody who had already done this, right. so that I could just do it the way right. they did. Oh, so and you could, actually were the first. Well, I, there were a couple of people who were, uh, they were doing. Like they were, they would release the, their PDF for free, but then yeah, they would encourage they, you to. Did Next Month Games do that? Um, they sure. yes, they they released a free PDF, but there were some people who were releasing free PDFs, but then asking you to please PayPal them some money. Well, yeah, you know, there were, but, but there was no system, right? There was yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of had to jerry rig something together. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly worked. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, it, it was an exciting time. I remember, uh, well, uh, it, it's interesting because at the time I could see not just how many sales I was getting, but, but who I could by name. Right, and yeah. So yeah. Uh, Eric Noah was uh, customer number one. Was he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I was probably number two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in that list somewhere. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so we're at Mount Habit Press. Uh, well, like technically, it's still going on, but uh, I, I, the last product that I'll have published was in 2007. Mm. And one of the uh, freelancers is, is an up and rising chap called Mike Mullis. That's right. Uh, yeah, he wrote Iron Heroes for you. That's right. So yes. What's Mike, what Mike Mullis got to work with? Both as an employee or as a freelancer, then later as a to the co-worker at Wizards. That's right. Um, Mike's a very creative guy, uh, very hardworking, and, uh, you know, very interested in, in kind of matching the game to the player's expectation, right, right? and yeah. what the player's needs. Um, and so, you know, he and I kind of conceived of Iron Heroes together but really, it was it was more just kind of a I had this initial idea and he took it and ran with it and did all these amazing things mm. with it. Um, you know, so all that credit goes to him mm. uh, as to how to match. You know, it was it was just this really wonderful way to you know create a a, a way to use the D twenty system without without magic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. 
but I'm going to jump back to Shanna for a moment. Um, and it, is it a similar situation for you in the uh, when you started, you know, running your own sort of business as opposed to just writing? Was that a new set of skills you had to learn? Um, yeah, well, it's so long ago that I'm trying to yeah. remember. Um, <laughs> I think I think that similar to Monty, it, it sort of hap it happens that I have those skills. Right. Um, I didn't always know that I had them, um, but as soon as I sort of got into that experience, I, I was like, hey, I'm really good at doing yeah, this. Yeah, I was delighted yeah, to yeah. find that I was yeah. good at it. Because one of the things that, of course, they don't teach you in, in any kind of creative education is how to run the business sure. aspects. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so if I had not had those, um, and, and actually pretty quickly discovered that most people didn't have them who were writers. And that surprised me because I assumed it kind of came as a package deal. Right, yeah. Um, and actually started helping my friends do things like you know, manage submissions and mm -hmm. keep track of their taxes because it yeah. was it was something that, that the creative you know that right left right and left brain thing doesn't always uh, join the way that yeah. it should. No, but one thing I did see said to people on online frequently when they, they talk about self publishing their own works is you know, do you want to be a writer or a publisher because they are you know they they're not the same job they're not the same right. the same thing and invariably they they tend to want to be a writer rather than a publisher. They, you know, they want to write their stuff and get it out there. But I mean, um, becoming a publisher as well, it's, 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 a, it's just kind of a leap of faith, isn't it, in a sense? In that, you know, you're not... You're not a leap of well-researched faith, perhaps. <laughs> 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 um, I think that it is, you know, if, the, if, if only there was sort of a, a diagram that explained all of the parts of being a publisher, yeah. of which writing is, is probably the most important, but also one of, just one of many, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a great book, then all of the social media and yeah, taxes matter, and yeah. all of those things, right, it doesn't matter. Um, but I do think that, you know, the publishing aspect is, um, is takes up a lot of creative energy, surprisingly, because it seems like it's very business focused, but when you're doing that for a creative product, there is, there is a lot of crossover, and so you have to know kind of how many tools you have in your toolbox mm. and, and how often you can use them. Like, if I spend all my time writing a great marketing blog post, have I just pulled from something else that I should be writing right. for a book yeah, and okay. how do you yeah. manage that time and, and creative resource, I mm. think is the hard part. Do you enjoy that side of it though, this, this business, you know, creating, running, successfully running a business? I, uh, <laughs> <coughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, there are times when it, it actually is like playing an elaborate game. Mm. Um, and, you know, making all, bringing all these pieces together and making it work and, you know, coming out with a, a great looking book, sort of like, you know, the victory condition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, in that way I do. Uh, but, but I, I also agree with Shauna that sometimes you feel like you're, you're spending all your time working on, you know, a marketing plan or, or talking to yeah. salespeople or whatever. Which is kind of not what you got into it to do. Exactly. Yeah. And I'd really much rather be writing about dragons yeah. and lasers. I mean, like, um, I've noticed, and I'm sure it's exactly the same for you, but uh, I've like, run a couple of Kickstarters. Absolutely. And I find that the actual process of running the Kickstarter is you're, you're doing this for a month and thinking, I want to get back to writing my game. <laughs> That's what I want to be doing. But no, I'm, I'm doing <laughs> admin and marketing and publicity and things like that. And this isn't... You know, this, that's, you know that's, that's not the goal. That's, not what, that's right. not what you want to do. Right. It's kind of the necessary evil. It's the, the mm. hoops you have to jump through sure, in order yeah. to be able to write your game. Unless you get to employ people to do that for you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you went back to Wizards a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I know you can't talk much about this. But uh, are you able to talk about how that came about? Um, well, uh, so... Basically, Mike Morales uh, came to me and you know kind of told me what was going on and that they were working on a new edition and uh, they had sort of looked at some of the past successes and some of the past failures and, and wanted to recreate some of the successes and avoid some right. of the failures okay. uh, and uh, and so brought me on um, and. Uh, Basically, uh, again, it was sort of a situation where, you know, people were starting to talk about things like, we have to save D&D. &D. Right, okay. Uh, and, you know, that's a soft spot for me. So, 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 so for a second time, it was, we have to save D&D, &D, cool, Monty Cook. Well, yeah, but the weird thing is, is that in a way, 
I, I kept thinking to myself, I've already done this, yes. right? I've, I've already created the, the d or helped create the D&D that I love and want. And, and uh, so it, 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 it felt a little odd to be coming back. But at the same time, you know, uh, D&D is very important to me. Right, sure. I mean, you, you mentioned that one of the reasons you originally left was because you, know, you started to find a, a corporate environment less comfortable to, to work in. Did you find that a challenge going back again? Um, having run your own I did, uh, but I always, um, you know, when Mike approached me and what I agreed to and everything, it was always a short term right. uh, thing. Yeah. It was never a, oh, I actually never was an employee the second time. Mm. I was always a contractor. That was always the intention. I mean, I knew that. It's I just saying to leave the game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the only person who happens to the coast twice. <laughs> Is that? I don't know. Maybe willingly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The only person who wasn't laid off. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you, you you stayed. You know, you stayed there for a, it's a few months. It's almost a year. It's almost a year. And I, I, I assume I know you can't talk about it, but you know, you're in the fifth edition, as it's now. Mm-hmm. Now, called is uh, probably you know bears quite a lot of your footprints on it. I actually have no idea. Have you not seen the I have latest it. documents in the last? Not, not, since, not, I, not since I left. Oh right, right. right. I presume you'll be buying a copy. I hope so. I yeah. hope to. Yeah, as soon as it comes out. But we'll move on from that. I know. You, I, I know. You, I know. You, you know. I'm, you know. Much as I'd love to, you know, grill you about your time at Wizards, I know you can't talk about that very much. So let's, let's move on to the fun stuff. Okay. So let's, 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 let's move on to Monty Cook Games. Okay. So you and Shanna founded Monty Cook Games. That's right. So did, did you know you were going to do that before you left Wizards? Did you leave and then think, what am I going to do now? Oh my God, I better fund the company. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what kind was of. The... Uh, it's not that far from the truth. Um, that uh, it was really sort of a... Well, you know, it, it was never, Montico Games was actually never meant to be this company. Uh, it was really just uh, a, name, a, name, <laughs> right, yeah. a name to publish under. Um, I knew I didn't want it, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want Numenera to be Mal, uh, Malhavit Press. Right. Uh, because Malhavit Press means D20 and it sort of means something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we, just, we had to call it something. Um, we were only going to do one little tiny book. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the plan. Yeah. So, you had to, mm-hmm. really, really had to. One of you had to take credit for the idea, Numenera. Oh, that's not Monty. Is that Monty? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that was me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was something that you had, you know, 20 years ago, kind of put on the back burner for a really long time. You didn't even... Yeah, so a that, lot of the so ideas long... that became Numenera... Um, were actually ideas that I had back in the early 90s, but had to kind of shell because right, yeah. I had been hired by a TSR. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So you, you began working on Numenera. Did you know at first that it was going to be a Kickstarter? Or was that, did that come later? Yes. Um, I had, basically, after leaving Wizards, I knew, I mean, I was just fascinated by Kickstarter, just as a, a sort of a phenomenon. Yeah. I've been watching it very closely and backing projects and, yeah, and rebuild things like that. Yeah, exactly. So incredibly well. Yeah. yeah, and I was just fascinated by it, and I wanted to try it, if for no other reason than to seven just cooks, make it. Seven cooks, by the way. What's that? <laughs> seven cooks. How does it feel to be a standard unit? <laughs> <laughs> Odd. <laughs> but anyway, we were... Uh, so, you know, yeah. It was something that we that we well we talked about right. both of us. Uh, we really wanted to just try it and see if we could make it work. Well, and we uh, you know when you had originally brought the idea, you had said that it, you know it was something that you were really passionate about, and we didn't know if anybody would even uh, anyone else would be interested in it. So it was also kind of a trial to see like you know here's this totally new idea from mm-hmm. someone who's really known for D twenty games that that breaks a lot of the molds and goes in all kinds of different ways, um, and so you know. The sort of passion behind it from you was, was not going to allow you to not make it. And so we really wanted to see whether other people would be interested in it. Kickstarter seems such a great way to, to sort of explore those waters. Because it does, it does the market research for Absolutely. you as well at the same time right. as the fundraising. Right. Exactly. And if people aren't interested, then, then you know. Then you know. And you know. Yeah. Yeah. Time and money. Yeah. 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 And then exactly. we're like, well, we'll have to actually get real jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kickstarter. You 
you start your Kickstarter, I mean, we've spoken about this before, but you have to do 20,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Initial first one. And, uh, and, and you end up with um, exactly one cook. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> but, but about, you know, uh, approximately half a million dollars, which is an astonishing amount. It yes. really is, you know, incredible. And I think I know, it's probably fair to say that your name was part of that. Uh, yes. I mean, I was a known quantity. Yeah. You know, um, having my name on the. You know, player's hand looked under my sky. Yeah, did certainly. Not yeah. I mean, you've, you know, you've earned it, certainly. Um, you know, that's you know, your reward for, for, for all those years of hard work, isn't it? It's, uh, I'd like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but, it's, but it's, uh, where I was going with this was it's not it's not just the name. It's uh, it's also it was a very you know well well managed Kickstarter. Well, and you know, I want to put into uh, you can't overlook uh, Kieran Yander's artwork, mm. which I think really kind of blew people away. Right. Uh, yeah. Right away. Kickstarter page. I think a lot of people took a look at that and they said, "Oh, this isn't just the same old thing." Mm. Um, so I, I give Karen a lot of credit. Cool. Well, I think what's what is also impressive is the. I mean, I know there were big Kickstarters before yours, but um, I think yours inspired people as well. I think I think I think, I think you you kind of showed people what could be done. Yeah. Mm. I mean, not not everyone's going to you know make half a million dollars in you know producing even now, but. They, they sh you showed people that people could achieve, you know, I, I was inspired by it, I, you know, I, I launched Kickstarters because you did, Good. and I saw, you know, <laughs> and I even studied your Kickstarter and thought, right, how did, how did they structure it, how did they do it, what, what, what can I learn from this? Well, you know, one of the things that I'm happiest about in that regard is that what I think the Numenera Kickstarter really did was it showed people that that the audience out there is very interested still in RPGs, mm -hmm. you know, that because you know, we'd been, people kept saying, oh, RPGs are dying, yeah. no one's playing them anymore, no one cares, and here's a brand new RPG, brand new setting, you know, it's not a license, it's not a, you know, yeah. anything, and, uh, you know, it breaks some records at the time, and I think that, I think that did really kind of show people and make people realize, oh, Maybe maybe yeah. RPGs are still yeah, around for, yeah, yeah. for a while. And uh, I mean, you uh, you sort of shared your uh, sort of shared your experience, but you you, you shared you shared your advice in the form of a form of an ebook on mm -hmm. how how it worked successfully. You both yeah. you both worked on that one. Mm -hmm. I I bought it and made it myself. I, I used much of the advice. I think one one particular piece of advice is the you know I've heard you give is that you know running a Kickstarter is a full time job yeah. in itself. It's you know you you can't just start a Kickstarter. Sit down, look at it again, day, 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 day. And go, Why didn't that fund? I don't understand. You know, it's, you know, you're doing stuff every day. Right, absolutely. I mean, Posts and replying to people's questions. And so, how do you guys find that process? Do you find that, you know, arduous? Do you find it exciting? Do you... Well, it's interesting because, you know, so now we've done two big ones and they were very different experiences. Really? Okay. Um, I don't want to say that. Um, but, so the first one was very much a surprise. We uh, we did a ton of research beforehand to see what was successful for Kickstarters, mm -hmm. um, and yet the fact that it went it grew so big and so fast, we felt like we were always sort of playing catch up. Right. Um, and the other thing that I think that I at least didn't expect was the passion of the fans, not just about the game, but about the inter the ability to connect with us during that process. Okay. Right. It was like I think one of the interesting things about Kickstarters, specifically with RPGs, is that we have such a passionate fan base who really wants to interact, and this is a great opportunity for them to do so, um, and, and to, to take a role and to be active and to participate, um, and we weren't prepared for that. So that was that was more time than we expected, but it was also, it was just so wonderful to be able to see fans have those kinds of reactions mm -hmm. and, and to be integrated with them in that way. Um, and so we prepared for that a lot better, I think, in the second Kickstarter. We understood that it wasn't just about us putting the things out there, it was about that interaction and, and always being responsive, and um, and so we, we we had a lot more done ahead of time in terms of like a lot more. We were just more prepared. We had a schedule, and we had a better understanding of how much time it took because it is so time consuming. And we knew that during the time we ran the Kickstarter, we really couldn't work on a product. Yeah, you know, it just yeah. wasn't. Yeah. It, there just isn't enough time in the day to do both. So, so the second one. I mean, had you had you at that point modified your expectations as to what what was going to happen with that? I mean, that didn't blindside you again, did it? Was it? Um, well, it, you know, it still ex it exceeded our expectations, right. but it didn't. We, yeah. I mean, Numenera just bowled us over. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. And the, with with the strange, we we had more uh, 
um, a little bit more accurate way of looking at people what we have what happened. Uh, we still surpass that, but yeah. Yeah, but we, I think we definitely, and we, you know, the one of the great things about the first Kickstarter is that not only did it create, you know, a series, a, you know, a whole game line and a series of books, it actually created a community, right? Because originally it was just, you know, Monty and I were like, we're going to make a book. <laughs> and by so, the time that so Kickstarter you weren't initially going to do all these different books for you and I. You were literally just going to leave it at the one. Yeah, we were just going to have one small black and white. So well, with twenty thousand yeah. dollars. So you actually, in a sense, in the process of one month during the process of one Kickstarter, you totally rewrite. You know your next few years. The, you know, your vision of absolutely, <laughs> yes. absolutely. If you had asked me, you know, the month prior to us launching the Numenera Kickstarter, what are you going to be doing in in May of, of yeah, twenty fourteen? Exactly, Probably have been this. It's an astonishing thing, isn't it? It is. I mean, yeah. like, I gather you are, you're certainly a big fan of, of Kickstarter. Oh, very much so. Uh, how, how do you think it's affecting the industry as a whole? Uh, I think that it's extremely positive. Um, you know, <clears throat> just to, to continue to use Numenera as an example, uh, we, we never would have been able to do a book that was 416 pages full of color with you know the print run that we yeah, did and, yeah. and the follow-up products. I mean, and and I think that's true for a lot of other people as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, you know maybe true for you as well that you know you couldn't you've even done any project yeah, you anything at all, it, right? So it, it is enabling yeah. this this amazing creative force um, that that drives our industry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the it's the games and the worlds and the settings and the you know the, the ideas mm -hmm. that you know kind of keep our industry going. There's something else showing in one of those, you know, one of those exciting times again. Yeah. You know, you feel this sort of buzz, I don't know if I'm, I'm making sense here, but it's this energy that, you know, you can see everywhere with everyone. I, I feel at the moment. Like, yeah, and, uh, you know, from what I hear, you know, RPGs are doing better than ever, or not maybe better than ever, but better than the last five or six years, mm -hmm. you know, in, in stores and retail, and, and uh, you know, I, I definitely think that we're in a, we're in a big I think we are too. Yeah. So, um, you are, uh, I mean, historically, I, I, I would say that you're sort of known for heavy, punchy games. I mean, you worked for Iron Crown Enterprises back in the day and then produced, you know, Rockmaster, which is not exactly rules like. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, of course, D&D &D Third Edition isn't rules like either. That's quite, you know, that's quite an inch of a heavy game. Exactly. But of course, Numenera, on the other hand, is, you know, it's a very rules like game. What's What's the big change there? Why, is is your, your personal taste changed? Or? You know, I actually, uh, I, I totally understand that question and I totally see why it seems like a big change. But the real truth of it is, is that I like lots of different kinds of games. And this was just the opportunity for me to do something different than I had done before. Right. But it's not like I, you know, don't like D&D 3rd &D Edition yeah, anymore. Yeah, of course. Or, uh, you know, or, or that I wouldn't have liked Numenera 10 years ago. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I we play a variety of different games, and uh, I mean, I'm just going to interject with something about that. What is it called? Currently, game. Well, it it is uh, it is mostly Numenera. Um, is there a Numenera space hack? <laughs> yeah, I've I've hacked Numenera into a space opera game. Interesting. Uh, and just, OD&D. Yeah, uh, about uh, about once a month. Yeah, I think uh, I saw something on the, on the intro webs about you. Playing an OD&D game is that? Yeah, it, it it is. I I'm finding it very refreshing to go back to those roots. You know, I started playing D&D with OD&D, and uh, uh, it's it's enlightening in a lot of ways to see the game and how it started, and 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 in so many ways to see how. This game that became a phenomenon, mm. as it was written, is almost unplayable. <laughs> right? And so, but 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 I see that as a good thing, not a bad thing, right? Mm. Because what it forced was it forced everyone to kind of inject their own creativity mm. into it. Now, I'm sorry. I mean, I uh, my gaming group, I think Al over there is one of my gaming group. Um, we uh, experimented with uh, an old '80s game about a year, year and a half ago. We were playing through it, and I was like running this game, and I suddenly realized at one point. Hang on, this game doesn't actually have a task resolution mechanic in it <laughs> anywhere. No. <laughs> it tells you how to generate characters, it tells you what all the skills mean and stuff. It doesn't tell you how to 
resolve, it doesn't tell you how to pick a lock, right? <laughs> I, I, I played this in the 80s, I, I knew how to do it, but <laughs> how did I know that? I, it's not in the book. Yeah, isn't that fascinating right. that, that we all just sort of, you know, figured it out. And, and not we didn't all just figure it out, we all figured it out in the way that we wanted to, right? So if someone wanted it to be really complicated, they created their own kind. And if someone else just wanted to say, ah, you open the lock. Sure. That worked too. My, uh, my first experience was my parents bought me a, it was a Warhammer Battle box set. It was a box and it had three black and white books in it. And it was a yellow box. I can't remember which one it was. But it was, it was a tabletop miniatures. Sure. Um, thing which you used to uh, measure ages. You know, it was that, sure. that sort of thing. Because I, I didn't know what a tabletop battle game was. I'd never seen one. I've never heard of one. And somehow I took I took it to school because my parents had it. It was, it was for Christmas. It's amazing. We started playing it. We played it like a role playing game. Um, but we'd never heard of a role playing game either. <laughs> so we had a, a set of tabletop battle rules and we were run, essentially running characters through a dungeon. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, in, in the sense of a role playing game, we just made that up by ourselves without any. Well, it's very true to the roots of the game, right? That everything sort of started as yeah. a war game, and and it, at, but, but I think I think that speaks a lot to the power of role playing, right? That that it just sort of it be, feels natural to start to kind of treat these game pieces yeah. as characters and, and uh, assign to them, you know, personalities. Sure, yeah. And, and yeah. So, uh, the strange is um, we jump the subject there, but <laughs> yeah, we, we're kind of running short on time, and I wanted to cover it. Okay. Because um, they're going to kick it out. They said they were going to kick us out at four o'clock, and it's just gone. All right. <laughs> Shani, you got the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so The Strange kicked out here last year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's due for release about Gen Con. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm definitely, definitely picking it up, without a doubt. Now, Bruce, as has been said in like, numerous interviews and uh, you know, articles and things, he's an, he's, an old, he's an old friend of yours. And, mm -hmm. uh, you brought him into the company from Wizard of the Coast. Um, to work on the strange, how, what, how, how did you end up? I mean, did you have to persuade Bruce to leave Wizards and say, "Hey, come work for me on this idea of yours," or did Bruce approach you? How, how, how did uh, that happen? Well, I came to Bruce, um, but uh, it didn't. It didn't take a lot of convincing. Right, okay. um, you know the, and you know the the idea was. Uh, the, the original idea for The Strange is Bruce's, yeah. uh, and so he and I had been talking, and you know I knew that he had been kind of kicking around this idea that he was thinking about in terms of fiction, and uh, uh, it, it, it just sort of all clicked together. Oh, you know, this should be a game. Yeah. And, uh, and so coming to him and, and seeing if he wanted to join us, uh, it just all felt very natural. Um, it was sort of the next... Step. You mentioned the first time we spoke, you hadn't really worked directly with Bruce all that much over the years. Not on anything that actually got finished. Um, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> well, you did finish the strange though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were a few things here and there, but for the most part, no. Um, uh, he and I worked together uh, when when we were at when we were both working for Wizards yeah. at the same time, this most recent time on fifth edition. Um, and uh, we, at that time, it was it was Bruce and I and Rob Schwab were sort of the, the main design team. Mm. Um, and now Rob is He's with you as well. Freelance with us as well. One day, Mike Wells will keep it. And the time will be complete. <laughs> so, um, but it all, it, it all just kind of came together naturally. I think, you know, I think it's appealing to anybody to uh, after working in a in a corporate environment mm. for a lot of years to have somebody probably come to you and say hey how would you like to write exactly what you want to write and and you know this this idea that you've been kicking around let's let's publish that sure. um, so I don't think it was hard for to convince Bruce to, to join what, what is the, uh, the sort of like day to day environment in Monty Cook games then you, you... well we are uh we don't have a central office. Right. Uh, we're all working our own respective offices, um, and uh, and so that means that but you're all very local to each other, aren't you? You're no, we're not actually. actually. Uh, well, Bruce Bruce is very close, but uh, we also work with Charles Ryan and Tammy Ryan, and oh, they're right, yeah, okay. halfway across the country. Okay, I don't know the geography of 
Yeah. <laughs> We're way People over on the left. People say faces, and, and I'm like, they're yeah. sort of in the middle. <laughs> is that, yeah, it's the, it's the West Coast, it's, it's New York, it's Texas, it's, it's the war, is there? <laughs> they're, they're in the middle there somewhere. <laughs> I mean, Charles is a, is a lovely, lovely person. Right? Yes. I you know, always very enjoyed it. Talking to Charles, so yeah. I mean another person who used to be at Restless in the Shadows. I mean. Absolutely, um, yeah. And so we, and so our real philosophy is um, to, to really support that creativity. Is that you work when you want to work from your home or wherever you want to work, um, and if you get your work done, then you know there's no other constraints. Right. right? So yeah. you don't have to try take days off to get sick. You don't have to take to, you know you just have this. It's no clock to the, punch. Yeah, there's no yeah. watching people. Everyone's working with shadowy employees, employees, freelancers. Uh, yes. yes, the core yeah. five yeah. members of the team. Yeah. Yeah. And so we we really try to create it because we've all, we're all creative. And we've all worked in corporate places that you know accidentally often squelch that creativity and, and sort yeah. of make you fight against it. In so order you know, to you do know your what best. mistakes not to make. We hope. <laughs> yeah, so, it's not um, that we it, haven't made mistakes. Yeah, it's, yeah, but it's it is hard. We, you know, we meet once a week, week via G plus. Um, we run play. We typically run a play test once a week. Um, uh, as a team, and so we try to do things that you know we have summits where we actually get together in person. Um, so it's it's really wonderful that we're all so we're all able to do our own thing in our own places. Mm -hmm. But it's also we work hard to make sure that we come together as a team and, and are able to connect too. Cause mm -hmm. It's really easy to get kind of lost in doing. Yeah, I mean, how, how how do you deal with with that sort of you know spread out kind of? Um, well, you know the internet makes it pretty easy to be honest. And we've all worked in corporate environments before, and so uh, we know what it's like. You know, the, the, it's very, very common for me to say to Charles or to Tammy, you know, if we were in the same building, I would just walk by and look into your office or, or your cubicle or whatever mm -hmm. and, and, and say this to you, but uh, I can't have that, so let's have a G-plus meeting about this. Right, and, yeah. You know, we have to kind of formalize things that would otherwise be sort of more casual yeah. in, a, in another setting. Um, is that a disadvantage, do you think? Or? A, a little bit. Um, it, right, we, we miss the sort of casual brainstorming creativity conversations because yeah. right, things have to be scheduled. So we immediately like, bounce it, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it, we're not just sitting around. And, and actually, we do that a lot because we're in closer proximity, and so that we tend to have these sort of things. And I think that Tammy and Charles do as well. And so I think we miss out on some of that sort of just sort of inspiration kind of collective yeah. that happens when you're in the same yeah, place. Yeah. Um, but we have such an amazing team. I mean, we're, I, I don't know that the system that we have would work with other teams. Right? We have an amazing team, we're super passionate, does a great job at what they do. Um, we're really communicative, we're able to work out issues. And so I just feel like, I, you know, I don't know that I recommend our system to anyone else because they have to have this core team that's, that's super incredible to make right, it work. Yeah. Um, and so, so it works for us. Uh, you know, we are thinking about like if we grow, will we need to make changes? Right, because the bigger you get, of course, the oh, more yeah. the pieces there are. And so, um, and I don't always think that growth is, uh, you know, in in the plan, in the roadmap, is it? Um, it, it definitely could be. Yeah, um, we we we're. It is, you know, we we, we now have two game rooms, or we will yeah. come. Yeah. Um, and you know that that isn't just twice as much writing and twice as much editing, but it's twice as much contact with artists and twice as much yeah. mm -hmm. salespeople and twice as much everything, right? And so we're we're kind of bursting at the seams a bit in terms of all of us having a bit too much to do. Yeah. So so when you have eventually recruited everyone for business, I mean, what, what, what would it be easy just to move into their offices? <laughs> <laughs> just call yourself sorcerers of the sorcerers of the shore. <laughs> <laughs> like well, you know, it, it it is actually a huge advantage to have people who, basically, you know, most of us at, at MCG have roles that we have had before. Yeah. Right? I don't need to tell Charles. Well, here's how to write a marketing plan yeah. for a role playing game because, because he's done it for Dungeons and yeah, Dragons, yeah. right? So uh, that that's a huge advantage. I, I, in fact, I don't even know if it would be possible if, if we didn't already all have yeah. the experience that we yeah. have. Yeah, it's the, it's, it, is, it is the fact that everyone is such a perfect fit for their spot that allows us to be a, such a cohesive and productive mm -hmm. team. Because really the amount of products that we're putting out for Team of Five is kind of blows me away often. Um, and, you know, there are some times, like, 
Of course, getting ready for Gen Con right now is a big, huge, yeah. you know, with two game lines, a brand new core book, a player's guide, and our big uh, technology guide for Numenera, it has been pretty, pretty tight. Um, but that it wouldn't have even been possible if everybody wasn't just so perfect mm -hmm. in their roles. We would have just been. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really important to us, right? Especially as, as Kickstarter, you know, the fans who backed our Kickstarter put a lot of trust in us. Right. They put trust in us that we'll get things out that are great, that we'll get them out on time. And so we're willing to sort of go that extra mile and do that extra amount of work behind the scenes to make sure that those yeah. things happen. Well, you mentioned earlier about the, the direct contact with fans that you, you enjoy and you think is a, is a productive thing. I mean, that, I mean is that, that's a, an aspect of just modern day, you know, social networking and, you know, uh, fans that, you know, most, uh, most games do have direct access designers from, you know, even people from mm -hmm. the coast, people could sort of tweet White Mills, for example. Right. And of course, you're a great ambassador on Twitter and places like that because you're always talking to people. I see you all the time. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, you enjoy that, I take it. That's a, that's, a, that's a part of the process that you find, you find pleasant. I, I have always enjoyed, I, I don't actually even really like the word fans. Um, I, I've just always enjoyed the company of gamers. Right. Interacting with gamers, and you know, when I when I go to a convention, I'm more likely to be found sort of in the general gaming area than you know, hanging around with with the industry people in the mm -hmm. bar or something, because that's you know that that's how I see myself. I'm 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 a big game, sure, okay, you yeah. know, yeah. and uh, so it comes very naturally, I think, to both of us, right, to interact with people, and uh, you know. It, it, it just people know that when you know when you're interacting with them they people are smart they can tell whether you kind of I'm being Mr. Marketer now or whether you're just sort of yeah. talking to them I think and yeah and I'm, I'm actually really grateful for the internet that way because I'm very shy and I'm very introverted and so you know what things like Twitter allow me to do is is not be quite so shy and not be quite so introverted right. so it's a great opportunity for me um, to interact socially in a way that's actually really difficult for me um, it allows me to to be there when I'm there, and I can interact in a way that's positive and really fun and engaging. Um, but I don't get sort of all overwhelmed yeah, by my own shyness. So I think um, you know, I've, I've seen you um, in particular mentioning you, you, you sometimes struggle with some of the negativity you see. On the sometimes web. that's hard. Um, you know, fan, it, it comes with passion, right? That fans are so passionate and they're so wonderful, um, and yet at the same time, I think that. They don't, you know, it's sort of like you're standing at a cocktail party and hearing someone talk badly about you, mm. um, and th they don't realize that you're there, right? And so it's, it's sort of this kick in the gut kind of thing, yeah. because the internet is a cocktail party that everyone's invited <laughs> exactly. to. Exactly, everyone so, can see what you're right. saying. Right, yeah. and so it's yeah. not like you're standing in the corner of a private party talking about someone who's 3,000 miles away yeah. and can't hear you. Um, and so, but you know, and the only reason that that's actually hard is because we want the fans to love what we do. We want them to be have a great time and we want to give them what they want mm. and so you know um, and, and it to me it's really different you know if, it's, if someone doesn't like the game that that's that's great that's awesome right negative reviews stuff like that don't you know everybody's tastes are yeah. different and we're not yeah. for everyone and that's awesome as long as you find something that you love awesome um, it's just really this sort of negativity especially negativity that's that implies that we aren't working hard right because right? sure. we're just busting yeah. our butts to make great stuff and so um, or just negativity for negative Negativity's sake, I think is is tough, um, but I wouldn't take that away, right? I don't want to take, I don't want to strip people of passion because with passion comes that really amazing yeah. joy and wonder and desire to make games better. And so, I don't know. It's kind of the, it's kind of, it's hard, but it's also it brings good stuff with it. So I think it's something about this industry. I mean, you think, you know, uh, car fans say mean things about uh, the guy who designed the tires on the latest BMW. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, is well, it? I've been told that yes, that is exactly <laughs> what happens, right? And there are forums where... So, so it's literally just the internet, then? It's, I, it's everything? I, I think so. Well, I also think, perhaps, and I don't know if this is true, but, you know, the guy who designed the cars for the BMW isn't reading the forum about designing cars for the BMW, you know, tires well, for the BMW. Yeah, uh, yeah, but game yeah. designers, because we're so close to our fans, right, are, you know, and often fans are like, you know, have you seen this? <laughs> where they're, like, pointing out the thing where... Yeah. I suppose that's a bad analogy. I mean, you know, actors, perhaps, right, right, for sure. 
Although, oh, al- although there is a funny series of, of actors reading. Oh, oh yes, yeah, I have, I have seen that. I have seen that. That would be so much fun. <laughs> 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 and if you sort of like, um, I know, certainly I've seen you know actors here, but you ever sort of rein yourself back from actually looking at things that you know will be about you just because you, you know there's going to be negativity there because that is just how the internet works and you just rather not see it. Sometimes um, I, I, I do that. Uh, but, you know, if I think that, that there's going to be something constructive that comes out of it, mm-hmm. then um, then, I, then I will take a look. But uh, it sometimes there is just sort of a uh, a sense of, you know, I mean, I know I've I've been on the internet a long time. I know the places that, where you know uh, are going to be friendly and unfriendly. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and so, yeah, I, I don't see any reason in sort of wallowing or dwelling on the the stuff that's negative. Um, right, because it can really impede your creativity if you mm-hmm. if you right. It, I mean, we've seen so many people leave the game industry or the it, or the video game industry lately, right? Because of the negativity of fans. Right. Yeah. And there have been death threats and there have been all yeah. this other stuff. And yeah. and what fans, you know, I think what people don't realize is the impact of their comments, right? I mean, people, great creators are leaving the industry because they that that's so rough. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, having been a writer for twenty some years, I have pretty thick skin, and I actually actively search out that stuff partly because sometimes it's creative and partly because I can turn that around and make them a, and make it a positive experience for them right and so if someone is angry because of something a lot of times it's just a misunderstanding and they don't actually you know they're saying you know whatever they're saying it might not be true or they might have I can give them some information that will um, that will change their experience for right. the better it's not always true sometimes people just want to be mad and, and that's cool too right I mean but um but if I, if I can make their experience better with the game or just the industry, then mm. then I want to do that. It, provided that it doesn't take time out from, you know, my real job, which is mm. making stuff. Um, I, mean, I think you ever received any particularly personal kind of uh, uh, tweets or comments or emails? You know, I tell what they are, I'm not. Yes. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean do, you, do you find that hurt? Do you find that hard to deal with? Is that, is that a struggle? Um, or do you just dismiss it and just say, this person's crazy? You know, I don't need to read this. It, it is actually fairly easy to dismiss that kind of thing. Um, because, first of all, it's the internet, so you have no idea, right? That might be some 12-year-old kid, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, or someone who needs help in other ways. Um, but, you know, actually, to be really honest with you, and, and, and uh, maybe this sounds a little, uh, a little too Pollyanna-ish, the, the negativity that that I find most troubling online is not necessarily the negativity about me or my work or anything like that. It's the negativity that I see among gamers, right? right. The edition wars, the, the, you know, all of that, you know, you're playing this game wrong, you're, you know, your game isn't the true role-playing game, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, and it, you know, I, I hate to see what should be a, a hobby that brings us together tear us apart that way. And, you know, in, in a self-serving way, that hurts me, and it hurts Sean, and it hurts you. I mean, it hurts everybody if, you know, the more fractured and, and uh, you know, divisive that we become. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you have a sort of meta level to that, because people then blame different companies for causing that. Right. That, that, that very fracture that they're part of. Right. So, it, you know, it kind of feeds on itself. It does. It does. And it's... And it's you know, to be very practical about it, it's very bad for business, mm-hmm. right? From a, from a, you know, there are there are people out there who probably would love Numenera who will never look at Numenera because they have some sort of feeling about third edition D and D, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Or, or you know, some other sort of thing. Um, and you know, those th- these feelings of, of sort of armed camps that that you know we all yeah. fly a particular flag and and you know you going to betray the cause if you go and play a different game. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think that's getting less I do now. I think it's, you know, it, it, a few years ago it was... It was rough. It was like, I just, I'm like, my website, I didn't want to bother looking at it. <laughs> God. It, it definitely <laughs> it, was, it, it was. It was horrible. Yeah. But um, it, it, it is better now. And I think maybe partly uh, the edition has helped a little bit. Uh, I hope so. Um, that was definitely one of the goals uh, when I was there. Um, and it was certainly one of those 
while I was there, it was certainly something that I paid a lot of attention mm -hmm. to. It's probably why I feel strongly about it now, is I kind of immersed myself in just kind of seeing why that was happening. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, did you play fourth edition in Germany? I played fourth edition a little bit. You like it? Um, <laughs> it it <laughs> is not <laughs> my chosen way to play Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but it's a good game. I mean, it's a well-designed game. Mm. Um, but it's, to, for me, it's not D&D. Sure. Yeah. I mean, going back to the third edition and the, the process of designing that, I mean, the, and, and the monumental task of that is, how, how, did, how did it feel, like, uh, after having brought that game out and realizing you actually had succeeded in saving d and that this was a monster hit, everyone pretty much universally loved the game. I mean, there were. Uh, <laughs> were there many? I mean, there were, but okay. but but it was. It, you're right. I mean, it was a, it was a huge success, um, the kind of success that that D and D hadn't seen since you know 1980s. Mm. Um, it felt great, you know. Um, it was it was it's wonderful. Um, I'm still extraordinarily proud of of third edition D and D uh, and the the work that we did, and, and you know, uh, three years of my life, which were. Which were great, mm. you know. Working and you've really put your stamp on, yeah. you know, the, the, not just history of D&D, but history of, you know, the whole role playing game industry. Yeah. You're, you're right, you know, you're stamp, your name's stamped right there in the middle of it. Yeah, which, you know, it, 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 it's gratifying, yeah. You ever, um, you know, feel this, the pressure of that, like fans, uh, you know, seeing you as, I, I'm struggling to find the word. Um, seeing you as something other than perhaps you feel you are, like uh, I don't know, like Gary Gygax might have might have felt at that time, for example, or not so, I'm saying you're Gary Gygax, but you right, know, you know, know I understand. Uh, sometimes, um, because you know that that's sort of what, what I was saying before. But I don't even really like to use the word fans because it, and you know, and I've written before actually. You know, when people talk about role-playing game celebrity, right, mm. and stuff, that these words don't... I think they, the word rock star was usually contracting with you quite a bit. Isn't you it? know, those, but it just, it, it rings false to me, because <laughs> that isn't that isn't the way I feel. Mm. Um, you know, I, I just feel like a really fortunate gamer. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's not the way you come across either, which is, you know, you don't, you know, you know there are game designers who... There are. Certainly call... <laughs> yeah, 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 you know what I'm saying, so... <laughs> Because you've always, you know, in my experience at least, I can't speak for anyone else, but you've always been very, very approachable. Good. I've never, you know, I've never felt I can't. Really I've never felt I haven't been able to sort of just walk up to you and say, hi, Monty, how are you? I, I want that to be true. Yeah. That's partly just because of my, you know, name, Charlie. It's a horrible way to speak It's all you. Well, I mean, you flew all the way here just for this interview, I didn't you? Did. Yeah, yes. Yeah, this <laughs> Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. Thank you well. so much for spending the time to do it. Yeah. And um, we're going to you know, get this up online as soon as we can. Okay. Um, do you want to see it first, or are you happy with... Nah, just yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. We'll call it, you know, we'll, we'll draw a line on it there. Okay. Because we could, you know, could go on all day, but, yeah. you know, an eight-hour video is not it? <laughs> 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 But, you know, you're both, you're both wonderful people to talk to, and, you know, you're, 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 you're so easy to... You know, easy to chat to and talk to, and yeah, I'll really enjoy that. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you, great, like Shana said, great questions. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry, so you so much. Much. That was fun. You used to bunch of some computer games. Oh, you played World of Warcraft. I did, yeah.